And here we go. Chamber pressure looks good. for our Astro Live program. My name is Alethea. I'm the producer of public programs here at the Intrepid Museum. We have so much fun stuff going on all week long here for Kids Week. We've got NASA divisions here today. We've got the 501st over here having a great time. Later in the week, we're going to be having a man group. We have the gazillion bump show. We've got live animals coming too. So if you're not already here locally, please come on by. We'd love to see you here at the Intrepid Museum in New York City. So, if you're not familiar right now, we are live streaming our Astro Live program. This is something that we do every month. It is completely free on the internet, on all of the museum's social media channels, as well as through our partner, nasaspaceflight.com. Shout out to all of you who are tuning in through that. And uh, it is actually brought to you, thanks in part to a NASA cooperative agreement awarded to the New York Space Grants Consortium. So we're so happy to have our program running for you. Um, but this is going to be our February episode. We're so excited to have with us, of course, uh, retired NASA astronaut Joan Higginbotham here, who you might have heard from earlier today. And of course, uh, former NASA astronaut Mike Massimino, who is also our senior advisor for space uh, programs. So just, oh yes, a round of applause, please, <laughs> for both of them. So just a bit about each of them. Joan Higginbotham is an electrical engineer, a rocket scientist, and a retired astronaut. On her nearly 13-day space mission, her primary task was to operate the International Space Station Remote Manipulator System, better known as the robotic arm, assisting with the installation of the P-5 truss and supporting crew members during spacewalks to rewire the space station's power system and retract a solar panel. She's also the third African-American female astronaut to fly in space. Yeah, another round of applause. And then, of course, Mike Massimino. He is a New York Times bestselling author who served as a NASA astronaut from 1996 to 2014. He's a four-time spacewalker who completed two missions to the Hubble Space Telescope, including the final Hubble servicing mission. And he was also the first person to tweet from space. So I'm so thrilled to hand it over now to, of course, Mike and Joan. Take it away, you two. Thank you. Thank you very much for the intro. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's uh, really my pleasure to get a chance to talk to Joan. We, we've known each other for a long time. <laughs> we, were, uh, we interviewed, we first met when we interviewed together to be astronauts, and then we were lucky enough to be selected together in the same astronaut class, the astronaut class of 1996, which was now quite a while ago. But uh, so it's great seeing my friend Joan again. So I'm, I'm going to like interview you here, all right? So Let's we're gonna, go. It's all about, it's about you here. You're our guest. Thank you very much for coming. But take us back. I, so I met you, and you were pretty young then, but you were younger even before. Like, you know, when you were a kid, see a lot of these young kids here, young people. Uh, take us back, Joan. You're originally from Chicago. So what was it like growing up, and what got you interested in pursuing what you ended up doing at NASA? Okay, so I was born in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I was alive when the first Apollo mission uh, and our astronauts stepped foot on the moon. I was young, but I was alive. And unlike many people, I was not enamored by that whole situation. 
So you're probably trying to figure out, how did I ever become an astronaut? I will tell you that uh, when I was young, probably about these guys' age, I was always very curious. I would take things apart and sometimes put them back, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so much. Uh, but I, I just always had a natural curiosity about how things worked. I always loved math and science, my two favorite subjects. And I was fortunate enough to be introduced to a pre-engineering program called En-ROADS, and that's what got me on the road to being an engineer. Uh, because I liked wires, I thought electrical engineering was the, the field for me, and, and that's what I did. I was lucky in that when I was in college, I worked for IBM for several summers, and back then, IBM was like Apple or Google today, and every engineer wanted to work for Apple, but when I was graduating, uh, IBM wasn't hiring engineers, but they wanted to bring me on, so they said, you can have your choice of 10 different cities and become a salesperson, which is not what I wanted to do. In the meantime, uh, NASA called me up. It was 1987, one year after the Challenger accident, and I had a gentleman ask me if I'd be interested in moving to Florida to launch space shuttles, and my initial answer was no. Now, I didn't tell him that. I just said no in my head, uh, but I did express a couple of areas of concern, one of them just having an accident the year before, so I thought that was a career-limiting move. This gentleman was one step ahead of me. He put me on a plane and sent me down to Florida, and I got to see a space shuttle, and I got to see the launch pads, and to me it was the equivalent of being on the set of Star Wars. And I was in hook, line, and seeker, and that's how my interest in NASA began. I said I'd give it five years, and I stayed 20. So what's, in so what's interesting about that, I think, Joan, is that, you know, like, sometimes people try to plan out what they're going to do. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. What do I do next? I don't know. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. But someone actually called you at NASA. Somebody when, when, called me. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And, and it's funny. Everything I planned to do in life, I didn't do. So every time I made a plan, I was like, the next five years, I'm going to do this. I did the polar opposite. So I had a plan, but I was willing to change it for really great opportunities that came my way. So was your plan, what was your plan back? You said IBM or computer engineering? It, or what was, what Electrical was it? engineering, and I was going to work for IBM because I had interned with them for two summers in college. They were a great company. They thought I was a great intern. Um, and so I just thought it was a no-brainer. I'd go work for IBM. Yeah. I, I worked for them, too, by the way. My first job after college was working here in Manhattan. Binghamton, New York. IBM. There you go. Two you would summers. Have to there you go. Yep. Not too far away. Okay. So that NASA, but take me back a, a little bit before that. Your engineering career, your engineering education, right? Mm -hmm. You want to become a, so you went, you went to, Florida. Is I went to happened? Southern Illinois University. Southern Illinois. Uh, the got Salukis. My, the Salukis. Does anybody know what a Saluki is? It's, a, it's an Egyptian hunting dog. Yes, exactly. My daughter has one. <laughs> I'm not kidding. My daughter has a Saluki, and it came from over there. It was like a rescue dog from Qatar or uh, UAE or someplace, but she's got, she has a Saluki. That's why I know Southern Illinois is a Saluki. I did not plan on talking about that today. <laughs> but you went to Southern Illinois University. I did. Which is not too far, I guess, from where you grew up. It's about five hours from Chicago. Yep. And uh, got my bachelor's degree there. And literally two weeks after college, I loaded up my 1980 Chevy Citation. And my sister and I drove down to Florida on bald tires. We didn't know it at, at the time. <laughs> but by the time we rolled up into Florida, the steering wheel was shaking just crazy. So we went to Sears auto body shop which does not exist anymore the gentleman looked at our tires he says well I hope you're not planning on going anywhere I was like we just drove from Chicago he's like you need some new tires the cars used to work like that back then you know they weren't now we pay attention more don't we right back then and don't you all right but NASA called you and you said yes I think that's that's a pretty good lesson sometimes you think about stuff of what you want to do but then opportunity knocks Every once in a while, opportunity will knock, and you need to answer the door and check it out. And sometimes it's, it's there in front of you, and you, you, took, that, you took that chance, right? You, it was, and it, it was probably off. one of the best moves I made in my entire life. Moving from Chicago to Florida, uh, it got me involved in the space program. One year later, 
we launched STS-26. It was the first shuttle to launch after the Challenger accident. A lot of pomp and circumstance around it because it was NASA's return to flight. And they had the rollout out of the vehicle assembly building at night. They had all these lights. It was just, it was phenomenal. I just got goosebumps watching it roll from the building out to the launch pads. That whole six-hour journey, I stayed there for the entire thing. That is cool. And, and you worked just about every shuttle mission, more or less. What was your, where was your actual job at, at the Kennedy Space Center? My what, first what? job at the Space Center was to work on the electrical systems on the shuttle. So every payload needed some services. It needed electricity. Maybe it needed cooling. Maybe it needed heating. Whatever it needed, we had to provide all the wiring for. So we'd check out the wiring. We check out the payload, we hook them up together and run it all the way through to make sure that when the astronauts would flip a switch, whatever was supposed to happen actually happened. So payload services is what I did. And then after that, about three years later, I became an orbiter project engineer. So instead of owning one system, I owned the entire shuttle. And my job was to tell uh, the management during a flight readiness review why the shuttle was ready to fly. And if we had an anomaly on the previous mission, if we fixed it, I can say we fixed the shuttle and it's ready to fly. If we couldn't figure out what was going on, I would tell them why we could fly with the condition. And if it happened again, what would be the ramifications? So I had to talk to people like John Young and tell him, yes, indeed, the shuttle is ready to fly. So based on my my engineering know-how and prowess, I would tell them that, yeah, we have a good shuttle, let's go fly. And that, you're a pretty young person to be doing that. <laughs> you're still in your 20s at this point. I'm a, yeah, I'm like so. 28, 29, and you know, at the time, I didn't realize the gravity of my responsibilities. I think if I had, it would have scared me out of my mind. Uh, but I was having so much fun back then, I didn't even realize how serious my job was. That's a, a great thing about the space program. You will get opportunity there. And young people have a, have a chance to really do some interesting things right Absolutely. from the start. Absolutely. All right. So what happened? Uh, what, what, what happened or what led you to start thinking about becoming an astronaut? So I was not really interested in becoming an astronaut. I thought I already had the best job in the world. I got the shuttle ready for the astronauts to, to fly on. I mean, what could be better than that, right? I got to walk outside my office and three miles away I got to watch a shuttle launch. What could be better than that? Well, what happened, as I say, what had happened was <laughs> my boss came up to me and we were having a conversation and he said, you know, you'd make a great astronaut. And he kind of smiled and I smiled at him and I didn't think another thing of it, except in the back of my mind when he said that, I took it as a compliment, but I'm thinking that is never going to happen, never in a million years. And so we went on with the day and about a month later, he came up to me and he says, did you put in an application to be an astronaut? And I just gave him one of those looks like, huh? Because I thought it was just a compliment. I didn't know he meant that I should take some action based on that comment. Um, and so I, I didn't do anything again. About a month later, this, you know, I said, okay, this is going to happen over and over. Let me put in an application to be an astronaut, which I did, again, thinking absolutely nothing was going to happen. And I was working third shift because we were about to fly the shuttle. I was working from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. And about 10 o'clock in the morning after I'd gotten home, I'm actually sleeping, trying to you know, sleep from the night shift. I get a phone call from Houston, and the lady says, hi, my name is Teresa Gomez. I want to know if you want to come down to Houston to interview to be an astronaut. And I'm thinking, okay, who is this? This is not funny. Um, and, you know, she went on with the story, and I'm like, hey, I was really sure it was an accident. I think she had gone into the do not call pile and got my number, but I was like, hey, we're going to roll with this, and that's how it came to be. I, I went down to Florida, uh, and I was, very, I was very surprised at the phone call, but I didn't realize how surprising it was because uh, I mentioned earlier, if you were here at 1 o'clock, that that year 6,000 people applied to be astronauts. And about 120 people got interviews. I was one of those 120 people. And you go down to Houston for about a, a week period. It's, it's like a job. All day long, you're being po poked and prodded. 
you know from a medical standpoint that you are a-okay or if you're not you, you know what's going wrong and then you do a series of tests some of them are psychological tests and you're there for an entire week and you get to meet some incredible people as you know um, and so you do that uh, about six months goes by because they actually do background checks the FBI comes to your house they find people in your life that you've totally forgotten about that they talk to um, they go through all your medical data and at the end of that six-month period, I got a phone call. And it was from a gentleman that I worked with, Jim Harrington. And, uh, and it's really interesting. During that month, the six-month period, there's a lot of rumors going back and forth. Like, hey, we know that they're doing FBI checks now. Or, hey, we know some people got disqualified. So you kind of know that it's coming. So I knew the phone call was coming. And everybody gets a phone call. My phone call ended up like this. Joni, we had so many good candidates. I did not get selected. They selected 15 people out of the 6,000 that applied. And then I was mad for, for someone who didn't want to be an, an astronaut. I'm like, what do you mean I can't be an astronaut? You interviewed me. Um, and so I called Jim. I said, you know, what can I do to position myself to be a better candidate? He said another more technical graduate degree, which I did not want to hear because I had just finished the first one. But long story short, I went back to grad school. Uh, NASA paid for it. I reapplied, we interviewed, we interviewed together, and we got selected together. So that's how all that came to be. Cool, so you, you got, you had two, you had one master's degree already, you said go get another. Right. Really? Right. And you did that. I did that. So, uh, but that's good, because, and you got pretty far as a finalist, you know, the lesson there is that even though you get really far and you're almost there, sometimes you still need to give that extra little effort push or you know right just keep trying and the other lesson is that this is a very competitive thing i've known some people who have tried four or five times one person tried for a total of 10 years one of our classmates to finally get accepted but you know it's such a large group that applies and such a small group that is selected i think the last selection they had like eighteen thousand people apply and they chose what 14 or so so it's it's extremely extremely competitive but unless you try, you're not getting in unless you try. Exactly. They didn't actually call you and say, we want you to be. You had to apply. I had to reapply you have a to second put, you time. You have to try. Right. And you also have to be okay with being told no. Right. And, and, and then trying again. And let me yeah. say this. The first time that I was not selected, I, was, I threw myself a big old pity party. I was having fun, just wallowing in, in my misery, right? Uh, and the guy I was dating at the time was very, very, very supportive for like the first week. Then after that, he's like, look, you got to suck it up. You know, you, you got somewhere where there are 5,000 other people that would have killed to have gotten as far as if you've gotten. Figure it out, suck it up, move on, which I did. Which you did, and, and you got in. And I and we got, got in. we got in together, our class. We did. I'm wearing our class patch. Are you wearing our class patch? No, you got other um, stuff. I don't have my but class this patch is our, on. this is our class patch. Right. I remember the sardine. They called us the sardines because? Because there were 44 of us. That is the largest class ever selected. Trust me, they will never do that again. We taxed their resources to the max. Uh, and then when you saw our class picture, we were all like this. So we looked like we were squished. So we got the nickname sardines, which is not bad. The class that came before you gets to nickname you. Um, and so some of the other names are like the hairballs, the hog. So... By comparison, the sardines was pretty nice and pretty accurate. We, we did all right. So we, we showed up together in that class, which was great. Opportunity of a lifetime. Um, what were some of the things you started? I mean, we, went, we went through water survival training together. We went through land survival training, camping out there, whatever we were doing. We went through all of our shuttle training and all kinds of training. What, st what, 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 what stands out for you out of those, those first couple those first couple of years together, we saw each other like every day. We, we spent a lot of day. time with each other. Um, we would socialize afterwards. Our class we, would get together would. like You're right. almost all the time after whatever it was holidays or weekends. We would always have something going on. We saw each other all the time. Yep. What stands out? This, let's go down memory lane here. What, so what stands out? I will tell you. So I'm going to see if you remember this. So we, we went to uh, land survival at Pensacola. And we had to essentially, so this was in preparation for us to learn how to fly the T-38 jets. And in the event something went wrong with the jet and you had to eject, this was training for that. So we did land survival, we did water survival. 
do you remember when we were out in the field and they hooked a parachute to us and put the other end to the, the truck, the flatbed truck, they would pull off on the truck. You'd have to go running behind the truck until the parachute caught air. So you caught air, you were up in the air, there's a flatbed truck that's towing you, and when you felt comfortable, you would give them the thumbs up and they would basically cut the line, right? And so we're, we're all doing that, running after each other and doing that. You know, I went, I think you had gone. One of our classmates was up in the air, I will not say his name. He, uh, he gave the thumbs up and what was happening when, when you land, you don't land flat on your feet because that's a lot of pressure as you're coming down from a couple of hundred feet down to the ground. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to hit the ground, kind of roll and flip over so that you disperse all of that energy. Well, one of our classmates didn't quite do his kind of tuck and roll. He hit the ground and just crumpled and didn't move. And you saw 43 people go running out in the field to get him. He had broken his leg, I think. He had a spiral fracture, whatever that is, but it doesn't sound good. He it had didn't. a spiral fracture of his leg. And I tell you what, within 45 minutes, they had an ambulance there. He was off to the hospital. We're thinking this guy's never going to fly, right? He just did something barbaric and tragic to his leg. But they got him on that operating table. They got him all hooked up. He rehabbed, and he was like amongst the first of us in our class to fly. But there was this camaraderie. We had only known each other for a couple of months, but there was this closeness that we felt that we had to help the other person get through whatever training we were going through. It wasn't a competitiveness. It was a team atmosphere, and we were all siblings, you know. We were in it for each other, and we were in it to get each other through the training. Yeah, that, that's, I think, a really important point, what, what's a what, what I don't know if I really was surprised, but what was very pleasant about the whole experience was is that it wasn't like, uh, who's the best out of you? For, it's like, who can work together? And if you needed help with something, it was there. It was, your team was going to be successful. Right. Either you were going to succeed as a team or you're, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna fail. And if you left one person behind, that was failure. Even if you got through something, if you let someone else not, if you did not help someone who needed that help and they did not make it through, then you also failed. And uh, that I, I love that culture, that atmosphere we had there. Right, and actually that was a good precursor for when you fly in space and you're there with your crew. Because you don't fly with your yourself, you fly with six other people. So either you're going to survive together or you're going to fail together. It is not one person's failure, it is the crew's failure. So that was a good lesson of, in how we were going to operate as a crew when we were in space. Yeah, but and that was from the get-go. That was the from real, the start. Yeah. Yep. We, we loved good. each other from the start. That was it, right from the, <laughs> right from the beginning. All right. So then, a few years go by. You know, there was a few delays in us getting going to fly. But uh, let's go to the, the flight assignment. Let's fast forward to that for you. Tell us about that. How did that happen? What were you doing at the time? What was going on? Because it was a yeah. f for, all, for our whole class. It, was, it took a while for us to get, get flying. It, it took a while, and I got to a point, I was like, I am never going to fly in space. It had been five years, and uh, I finally got assigned, and I was driving in my car one day, and I get a call from the head of the astronaut office. So it's like getting called to the principal's office. I'm like, what did I do? Why is he calling me? So he called and he says, uh, I hope you're sitting down. And I, I lied. Technically, I was sitting down. I was in my car. He says, uh, we're going to assign you to the mission of 117. That was my first mission. I was assigned to a different mission than I actually flew on. So he named uh, the commander and everybody. I had a couple of classmates that I was going to fly with. I was like, cool. Um, and so we were scheduled to fly in September of 2003. And if you remember NASA history, in February of 2003, Space Shuttle Columbia tragedy happened, and there were actually three of our classmates were on board. And because of that accident, uh, we stopped flying shuttles for a while. Uh, we were actually supposed to fly about six months after them, but everything got delayed, and it was another three years before we fly, flew. So we didn't fly until December 2006. So once I had gotten assigned to a mission, I'm like, yes, I'm going to fly. I'm ready to fly. And six months later, it's like, you're not flying anytime soon. So I'm like, I am never going to fly in space. You know, I, that recurring theme just happened. Uh, but we kept training. 
and there was a little bit of a shuffling of the crews, and I was taken off STS-117 and put on STS-116. Now, that in itself was a bit traumatic because, as you said, when, when you're with your crew, you have a crew office. You all sit in the same office. You train together every day. You fly together. You meet the spouses and the kids so they can bond together. And so I had bonded with my original crew. And then I was taken off this crew and put on another crew. It's, it's like the blended family. And I'm like, I have to start the bonding process all over again. So I was a little concerned about that. Uh, but I had uh, some great people come with me. So Roman was taken off of 117 and went to 116 with me commander. and became my commander, one of my classmates. And I had another really good friend, Robert Kerbeam, who was already on the flight. And so I knew everybody on the flight, and the bonding process began pretty quickly, and we bonded pretty well. When, when did that happen, Joan? When did you get, when did you get uh, reassigned to that flight? I think it was May of... It was either 2003 or 2004. Okay. Can't remember. Yeah. But I, I'll tell you a, a funny story. If any of you got my photo today, if you look on the patch on that photo, it says 117. And I never noticed that until I signed the photo one day. And the guy says, how come you have 117 patch on? I thought you went on 116. I was like, oh, good eye. So that's what happened. I was originally on 117, reassigned to 116. But when I took that photo... I was on the 117 crew. That's why I have that patch on my, my orange flight suit. A little bit of trivia for there you. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. So tell, we've got a few more minutes here. Why don't you, I think. Yeah, we've got a few more minutes before we go to the questions here. All right. So you get assigned a great crew. What was it like? What, 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 do you, what stands out for you on that, on that mission? I think for me what stood out the most besides flying in space were the people I got to fly with. I think, no, no offense, I had the best crewmates ever. <laughs> um, and, and there's just um, a very poignant moment for me, so I'm, I'm going to get a little nostalgic here. So on our flight, uh, we had, I call it the United, uh, the mini United Nations because we just had a very colorful flight. So the first time two African-American astronauts had flown together. Our commander was of Jewish and Korean descent. We had the first, uh, Pat, uh, Patrick was born in the UK. He became an American citizen, partially, so he could realize his dream of becoming an astronaut. Sunny was from, her parents were from India. We had the first Scandinavian astronaut, Krister. He was from, his mom was from Norway, dad from Sweden. On the International Space Station, we had Mike L.A., who was Spanish-American. We had Thomas Ryder, who was German. And we had Mikhail Turin, who was Russian. So we, we had a smattering of, like, everybody. And I always say it was really interesting because the ten of us um, came together and worked together for a common good on this little tin can of a spacecraft. I was like, if we can do that in this very confined space... Why can't we all get along on Earth where there is so much more space? So that, for me, was the best part of the mission were uh, the people that I flew with because they were tremendous. And uh, give us one space memory, and then we'll go to Q&A. Oh, one space memory. I think, for me, it was seeing my very first sunrise. Uh, my commander, Roman, nicest guy that you ever meet in the world, he sent a message down to the flight deck because I had my head buried in the back of the shuttle. He sent Roman to get me. He goes, uh, Beamer to get me. He says, Roman is really mad at you. I've seen Roman mad one time in 28 years. And I'm thinking, what have I done? So I fly up to the flight deck, and he looks at me, and he says, sit down. So I sat down. He says, strap in. I strap. He goes, just look out the window. He's like, you've had your head buried in the shuttle for a day and a half. It was my first flight. We were about to dock to the International Space Station, and I had to do something immediately, and I wanted to be prepared. So I was back there sweating it out, because once that door hatch opened, I was getting ready to go. But he's like, just take a minute to look out the window. And at that time, the sun was about to rise, and it just burst over the horizon, and it was so beautiful. And I got to see the, the atmosphere, which just looked like a little thin blue line. And it just made me feel very insignificant as a human being. 
and it made me realize how fragile the earth is and that we need to treat it very beautiful. So that was like one of the, my favorite moments from space. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And so we're, we're good now? Okay. Uh, we, I mean, we're good for questions. Yeah. Been, does and, anyone, uh, well, yeah. Take does it anyone away. have any questions for Joan or for, for Mike here? Any questions about their time in space? Or There's anything? a right. gentleman in the back. I'm going to run around with this microphone. Coming, I'm coming. Thank you for your service. Appreciate it. Um, I always think uh, astronauts are flying every day and they're up in space. What did you do in between missions or, you know, like your everyday job within, within, the, within NASA? So we, we had everyday jobs and there are a lot of things that need to be done by astronauts. So one of my jobs was testing out the modules that were going to be sent in space. Originally, someone had the bright idea, we're just going to put these modules up and we're going to attach them and they're all going to work. It was not going to go that way in space because if you got up there and the stuff didn't work, there's no way you're going to get it back down. And so we decided to test the modules with each other here on Earth before we did it. So one of my jobs was flying down to Kennedy Space Center and doing the testing of the modules to make sure they were compatible and they talked with one another. Uh, one of my other jobs was testing the software in the shuttle to make sure it's doing what it's supposed to do. But there are millions of jobs that you have on the ground that we have to do. What were some of your jobs? What did I do? I started out, I worked on uh, the computer branch, which was kind of cool, which meant like little applications we had on a laptop computer. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, my first one. Then I uh, went to the robotics branch, which was kind of cool. Then I worked in the spacewalking branch. And then I got assigned to a flight. And then after that, now before, I, before I left, I saw Beamer. She's mentioned this guy, Bob Kirby, a good friend of ours. Says, hey, I hear you want to be at Capcom when you get back. I go, I never said that. He goes, well, here, that's what you want. He was the head of the Capcom. So, so he recruited me for that. So I got to work in the control center after my first flight. And, uh, and then I did some more of the spacewalking stuff and then got assigned to a second flight and then more Capcom and other stuff. Come. It, was, it was really fun, though. It was the... We had a direct input into what was going to happen, I felt like, uh, even in the control center. You know, we were, when we were Cap, did you have a Capcom? Did you have, you, I Capcom, uh, I was like the first Capcom for oh, you International in Space group. Station. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so you guys had to create that job for the space, yeah. That was, uh, that was a whole different experience, I would imagine. But we, uh, after your hard work to develop that job, when we got in there, it was like we were, we, you, you walk right into the control room, and you saw a little bit of training, you saw working. So it was you're right out there talking to the crew and learning about what they're doing, and that was, uh, that was a great job. So, um, yeah, my hat's off to you for, for – because you guys really developed that job. We did, yeah, for, and, yeah. and we, it was interesting because we had to walk, work with the Russians at the time, and we had to use their communication assets because we didn't have our own. So it's like, mother may I talk on the, <laughs> the, the net. So it was very interesting. All right, right down here in front. Excuse me, what was your hardest mission? What was my heart? I don't know if I had a heart mission, but I will tell you, during our mission, we were supposed to take a solar array, which looked like a fan, and fold it up, right? And they told us, all you have to do is flip this switch, and it's going to fold up all by itself. That is not what happened. We flipped the switch, and the solar array started to crumple and fold up on itself. And because of that, that's not a good look for a solar array, let me tell you. Because of that, they had to develop procedures on the ground to go do a spacewalk to fix this. And that's always very trying because we train at nauseam before we go in space. And we can do these procedures with our eyes closed. So this is one procedure that we had never practiced uh, on the ground. And uh, we actually had to learn it on the fly <laughs> and uh, and we did a great job all right right down here uh, hi excuse me uh, can you tell me how long did the flight last so my flight was about 13 days mike how long was your flight uh, 12 and 14 so yep so about two weeks our friends do stay in space a lot longer now right Mostly. Mo uh, now the program, we don't have the space shuttle any longer, so it's typically longer stays on the space station for typically about six months. So a bit longer. Yep. Back a here. lot longer. Um, I have uh, two questions for Joan. First, um, you talked about the uh, Challenger accident 
and how that affected you. How did the 2003 uh, accident affect you? And uh, number two, uh, were you familiar with the um, characters in Hidden Figures, and did, how did that affect you? So I'll answer the second question first. I was not uh, familiar with the figures and um, the, the characters in Hidden Figures. I tell you what, when I saw that movie, I was so incredibly impressed. And every time it comes on, I watch it again. And, and I thank these ladies for what they did for me because it's on their shoulders that I stand on. Um, as far as the 2003 accident, um, it was... I remember that day like it was yesterday. As I said, three of our classmates were on board. Um, it was traumatic. It was um, devastating. Um, but I would tell you one thing. It did not make me not want to fly in space. Um, it didn't deter me from wanting to fly in space. I knew that we'd find out what the problem was. I knew that we would fix it and I felt safe flying on the shuttle. So, but it was, it was like losing family. Yeah. Okay, over here. Hello, uh, two questions also. Um, are there still yearly classes every year? Are there, are there more astronauts indoctrinated every year like there were? Um, and now that there's a private space flight like SpaceX, do, would NASA astronauts go on these flights when, when they do manned flights, or would they have their own astronauts go on these flights? Uh, sure. So your first one was, are we still selecting astronaut classes? Yeah, when, when Joan and I were selected, it was about every two years they were selecting. And that has slowed down a bit. Uh, it's now it's about every four years. They had a class of, uh, for example, a class of 09, a class of 2013, a class of 2017, a class of 2021, most recently. So I, they're on, they may change that up a little bit, but... Uh, you know, it's going to be pretty steady, I think. It may actually, I, I think it'll increase as they are doing more now at going to the moon and so on. So, yeah, I don't think that, that opportunity is going away anytime soon. You agree yeah. with that? Yeah. yeah. And then as far as the SpaceX stuff, like the, the, the uh, commercial, pro, we, NASA flies there, our astronauts, our colleagues that are still there working, and the newer astronauts that have come after us, the way they go to the space station is they, they go on a SpaceX vehicle. Um, but then there's also private missions. And a couple of our colleagues, um, Joni mentioned uh, Mike Lopez Alegria, and our other, one of our classmates, Peggy Whitson, has flown on these. They're no longer NASA astronauts, but they've flown on private missions as like the adult supervisor when they go to the, uh, when they go to the International Space Station. And then there, so it's still, you know, it's not, when you go to the space station, you go into a NASA facility. So even though it's a private astronaut, a private launch, and it's a private mission, you know, there's still, uh, they have involved some, uh, some experienced astronauts there to, to make it go more smoothly. Uh, but some of the other ones, you know, they're, they're just kind of the tourism things going on and uh, Captain Kirk going to space and everything. So that's generally, that's, that's really outside of NASA. You want to add anything to that? Nope. Okay, right down here in front again. Oh, where did you go? International Space Station or the moon? So we went to the International Space Station. Believe it or not, the last time any humans have been to the moon was 1972. But hopefully in the next year and a half, we're going to send uh, the next group that's going to orbit the moon. And the group after that, they're actually going to land on the moon. So maybe two years away to get man and women, because there's a woman on the crew, back on the moon. Okay, over here in the front. How long is the space shuttle flight from the Earth to the International Space Station? Does it orbit the Earth, or is it a straight shot? So it orbits. We actually, it's, it's a three-day, like a two-and-a-half-day process. So we're, it takes us eight and a half minutes to get to space. So we're there. And literally, you can launch any time you want to, but this is the thing. We were trying to get to a particular place in space to get to the International Space Station. And if the space station is here and you're here, you have to use a lot of gas to get there. So space station is here. We want to kind of launch here. And we, we track it for about a day and a half. Matter of fact, we saw it the second day. It was, it was very faint, but you could see the light. And we're like, I think that station. Uh, and then there is a thing called rendezvous operations where we intentionally come up under the uh, International Space Station, 
Then we come up in front of it and we back into it. So you have two vehicles going at 17,500 miles per hour. You slow down the shuttle so that it, it comes in about 0.1 foot per second so you don't knock the space station out or it doesn't knock us out. And then we dock together and then together we're traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. Pretty sporting, let me tell you. Right over here. How do you become an astronaut? What was that? How, How do you become an astronaut? Hot. So you become an astronaut by studying real hard, maybe something in the sciences or the engineering uh, aspects. Uh, and then you have to try out to become an astronaut. You have to put in your application and compete with a lot of other smart people like Mike here. And hopefully you'll get selected to be an astronaut. Right in the center here. Hi. Uh, you said it's like two or three days, right, when you fly to the International Space Station. Do you actually sleep during those two, three days, and for how long? Uh, absolutely. So everything is timeline, the mission, every single minute. We are allotted eight hours of sleep every night. There is a pre-sleep period where you get to you know, brush your teeth, wash your face, and, and then there is a post-sleep period where you get to wake up and brush your teeth and all that. But yeah, but we are timeline for eight hours of sleep every day. Now, whether you get that <laughs> is a different story. Did you guys get that? How were you doing sleep-wise? So the first night, I, uh, I felt like I was falling. I actually had my sleeping bag against the wall, the, the lock, mid-debt lockers. And about two times, I, I kind of felt myself do that. I, I felt like I was falling. So the next night, I actually laid my sleeping bag uh, parallel to the floor, and I made it really, really tight so that I felt like I had something supporting me. And I actually dug my head into the bottom and had my feet at the top, and I, I used my pants as a pillow. I rolled it up and use it as a pillow, and I slept better the second night, and I also took Ambien. That helped. <laughs> okay, right across the aisle here. You've had an amazing job and a career. Just wanted to know, how has seeing a perspective from space um, affected your life on Earth? I'll go, but I want to hear yours as well. Uh, it changed my perspective. I, I, I think we're living in a paradise, and... Uh, I think when you see the Earth from space, you see the true beauty of our planet, um, but you're, you're kind of admiring it from afar. And so I remember what I saw, but I try to apply it here, even in New York City on the subway, you know, how amazing it is that we're here because we get to engage our, this beautiful place every day. So I, I think we're living in a paradise and it's a, a home we all share no matter where you're from. We're all from the same place. So for me, uh, just to kind of expound uh, a little bit on what Mike, uh, Mike said, for me, um, it made us realize, be because we had such a diverse crew, that we are all a part of the same race, and that's the human race, and that we should all be working together for the collective good of humanity. So that's the perspective I had when I came back from space. All right, we have time for just a couple more questions way back here in the last row. Um, what surprised you most, if anything, about going to space? Like, what was most um, unexpected? Uh, did you what surprised that? you the most? I'm sorry, can you say that again? What surprised you the most about going into space, if anything, for both of you? What surprised, you? What surprised me the most was how hard it was to do very common things on Earth. So, like washing your face or brushing your teeth. Uh, the first day I was in space, it took me about 20 minutes to put in my contact lenses. We're here on Earth, literally, if it takes me 10 seconds, it's a bad day, right? But as I was balancing the contact lens on the tip of my finger, it kept falling over, so I couldn't get that good suction on my eye. So I'm like doing contortions and whatever, trying to figure out how to get it in. But it's just the simple things that you take for granted here on Earth that will eat your lunch in terms of time and space. I, I think... I. I, I, I 100% agree with that, of course. You know, everything is just, you're just flailing all over the place. I think, too, for some reason, I was amazed at how well-trained we were. You know, because I was like, oh, I don't really, especially my first time, am I really ready for this? How do I know? They're like, no, no, you're ready, don't worry about it. I go, how do you know? And they're like, no, we've done this before, you're ready to go. And, and we were, you know, we really were well-trained to do our jobs. To see the planet and all that, there's no way to prepare you to do that. But, but I was amazed at how well-trained we were to do everything we needed to do. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised with that. And our last question right over here. When you returned from a mission, what was your physical recovery like? 
For me, when, when I uh, came back, I felt like I weighed about 500 pounds. Um, and so we have the folks come on the shuttle and they help you get off. I, I was on the flight deck and I was uh, sitting behind the pilot and I was the last person off because of my position. Um, and my crew person came up and I stood up and I immediately fell back down in the seat. And he says, take off the parachute. Thinking, duh, 40 pounds. Took off the parachute. I stood up, fell back down in my seat. My, my legs were like spaghetti. So he's like, take your time, take your time. But the engineer in me kicked in. I was like, aha, I'm going to use the chair in front of me to help me stand up. So I did that, and I kind of scooted over to the ladder because there's a ladder in the shuttle. Turned around, went down the ladder. Then I had to get on my knees because the hatch is at a lower level. So I got on my knees. I crawled out the shuttle. There was a flight dock on either side of the hatch. And I, I had one, my left hand on one side of the hatch and my right hand on the other. And I looked at them and I go, I've fallen and I can't get up. I could not lift myself up. So each one kind of hooked an uh, arm underneath my arm and lifted me up. And as I start walking, I'm like slapping my feet against the ground because I'm just so heavy. So it took me about 40 minutes of being very deliberate about walking to kind of get my gait back to where it was before I landed. So I felt heavy when I came back. How did you do going up? Was it? Did oh, you I was feel fine going up. Yeah. yeah. See, I think it's one of the. So I, had, I did not feel good when I got to space. <laughs> you know, I, I, I barfed. That wasn't good at all. My first day in space wasn't. It was like, what is so good about this? You know, everyone. Went, but I was fine on the way back. I think it's one or the other, you know, and I think it's probably better to be better off going up than coming back. But coming back, I felt better than I was easy. That was an easier adjustment than the space. All right. Well, everyone, put your hands together one more time for Joan Higginbotham and Mike Massimino. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you both so much. Um, and Joan, it was so wonderful to have you here at the Intrepid Museum. Thank we hope you. to have you back sometime. I'm going to let you guys get off the stage here because uh, those of you tuning in at home we're going to have a special one-on-one -on -one with Joan so if you have any questions feel free to tag at NASA Space Flight pop them in the chat for us uh, and we will get to talk to her up there for a second but everyone else thank you so much for joining us today for Kids Week again this has been our Astro Live presentation for February we do these every single month uh, typically the third Sunday of the month from 3 to 4.30 and they're free so if you liked bye if you liked uh, hearing from an astronaut sometimes we have scientists and engineers from NASA and whatnot tune in it's again it's free you can uh, view it on any of the museum social media channels or on NASA Space Flight's YouTube channel um, also I'd like to give a special shout out today to our fabulous American Science language interpreters who have been uh, if you're tuning in from home in the box in the corner there or also any of you out here I can say thank you there you go clap for them <laughs> excellent thank you both so much for being here and uh, friends here on site there's still plenty of things that you can do here again we've got NASA divisions we've got the 501st we've got balloon making we've got a giant balloon space shuttle over there lots of fun things you can still go over there and make a capsule if you want and uh, otherwise, we hope to see you back at uh, the rest of Kids Week. It will be running through Saturday. If not then, we'll see you some other time here at the museum. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm now going to pass it over to Das, who's going to continue our live stream. Thanks, everyone. It's hot, by the way. All right. Uh, greetings from behind the scenes. Y'all should hear me. I'm Das, John with NSF, uh, up here in the control crow's nest. And like we mentioned, uh, we don't have ASL for this part. We will have ASL because Joan is going to sit down with us for just a second and answer a few more questions that have been coming in from online. So give us just a few seconds here to get all set up. Y'all can hear me, right? Yeah, y'all should be able to hear me. Um, we should have Joan sitting down. Into, I, she's actually right behind me. There she is right there. <laughs> um, we're going to sit down here and we will chat with Joan one-on-one -on -one in just a second. I need to scoot my chair so the camera fits. What, what was our plan here? Like, <laughs> <laughs> we're literally resetting the cameras, y'all. Um, this is this is Jason in the background helping us here. But uh, give us just a second. We're going to sit down over here and chat with Joan. We will have the ASL interpreter back. I apologize, we didn't have an interpreter for this. Uh, so. <clears throat> My talker, my, my mic need to be a little bit louder. You want me to like bring it up a little bit? I can do that. You may have to uh, turn it up on your end a little bit, but let's go up a level like that. 
Is that good, Kevin? How's that? Again, we were bringing some questions here, but I think we have the ASL interpreter as well. All right, like, not kidding. We're setting it up here behind the scenes, y'all. So uh, we're going to sit down. That's you right there. I'm going to remember to take off my headset so I don't uh, pull the cable loose. And then we'll have a chat with Joan for just a few minutes. All right. As soon as Jason's done with that camera, <laughs> we'll switch back over that way. This is our behind-the-scenes production here at Intrepid Museum. Who's been enjoying Kids Week, by the way? Y'all been enjoying Kids Week? All right. I think we're good to go, huh? All right. I'm going to give you the buttons to press. I'm going to take off my headset, and we'll be right back. It's like very behind-the-scenes. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll get the thumbs up. I think we're good to go. All right. Um, so, Joan, thank you for taking some time yeah, to hang absolutely. out with us here. Glad to be here. Thanks yeah. for having me. Oh, geez. Um, so, one of the things that's been a recurring theme all for Kids Week is sort of like central to your story. Because you didn't start off wanting to be an astronaut. Like, you came in as an engineer working for NASA for many years. Was it your secret plan behind the scenes? Like, oh, I'm going to get in and one day I'll... Or, or were you just truly going to be an engineer or whatever else? I was truly going to be an engineer. Once I got a trip down to the Kennedy Space Center and I saw my, my version of Star Wars for real, yep. I was happy doing what I was doing. I got to meet astronauts. I got to walk on the shuttle every single day. I walked out of my office and I saw the shuttle launch. Yeah. I mean, in my mind, it didn't get any better than that. So I was really happy with my career. Uh, nine years of being an electrical engineer, a rocket scientist, and then being responsible for an entire shuttle. Yep. So you, you got to walk on the shuttle every day, like yes. when they were turning it around, when they were preparing it for the next flight. Absolutely. Were you ever there on the shuttle? Like, did you ever get the impression, oh, I want to fly one day, or was no. it, I'm doing my job, I'm no. walking through? It, it was, I am doing my job, this is really pretty neat, you know, you, you go into the clean room, you, you get blown off with the air, you put on your bunny suit, bunny you suit? walk in, and the payload bay, and you know, I'm doing my job, I mean... I never, not there was never an inkling of, hey, why don't I try to fly on this thing? My job was, hey, I'm an engineer. Let me get this thing ready for the astronauts to fly on. And I thought the astronauts were, you know, they came in, they looked like they were 10 feet tall yeah. and, and uber smart and everything I kind of thought I wasn't. And I'm like, yeah, this, never, never thought about that. <laughs> it really is the thing, like, like. People think the astronauts are oh, uber smart, 10 feet tall, like you say, but all of the people who got their ride ready, like the amount of trust, the amount of preparation, yeah. um, the astronauts really, ha I, I, do you feel like as you changed over, um, did you feel like I am now the astronaut, I'm 10 feet tall now, or how did that transition yeah. work for you? Yeah, I never felt 10 feet tall or uber smart. <laughs> I was like, yeah, somehow I just kind of slid on in there. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Um, but no, again, it was, it was I'm doing my job. Yeah. But it was hard going from, uh, from an engineer getting the shuttle ready to right. being an operator on the shuttle. I had to slowly wean myself off of knowing what was going on with the shuttle ah. on a daily basis and the status of the shuttle because that wasn't my job anymore. Oh. My job was now to figure out what the mission was going to be and how I was going to accomplish my part of the mission. So it's totally different vantage point. Yeah, it's almost like a, the information you're concerned with. Yeah. When you're preparing the shuttle, you knew every little checklist I item did. and exactly where it is in the flow. Mm -hmm. And then when you're the astronaut riding the shuttle, you trust somebody else right. to do that job that you were previously doing. And it must have been hard, like, oh, no, I can't look at the... I don't. It was hard giving up control. <laughs> a little, little bit of a control freak. So it was hard getting up that level of control. No but kidding. then I remembered, I, you know, I knew these people. I worked with them. And if they told me this was good to go, I had to take it that it was good to go. That it was good to go. Right. And just like the astronauts trusted you to make their right. ride to space ready, right. you trusted the people, probably some people that were working alongside of you. Absolutely. When you were getting the shuttle ready. Absolutely. No kidding. Mm -hmm. There's your no kidding. I say no kidding a lot. People watching make fun of me because I say no kidding a lot. So, <laughs> um, 
Anyways, we were taking some questions from online, like during the presentation, okay. and a lot of people uh, wondered about your experience on the ride up. Mm -hmm. Like, where were you riding on the shuttle? Was it what you expected? You heard stories from astronauts that right. flew. Mm -hmm. Were you like, oh, this is no big deal. You're sitting back, like, just cruising along. Or were you like, oh, this is really intense? So I was on the mid deck. So I was on the bottom. I didn't have a window view right. uh, going up. I had a window view coming back. Uh, and so I didn't have a whole lot of things to do like the folks up on the flight deck. And so my job going up was to basically monitor all the calls and make sure we're hitting all the, the milestones and wait till we heard Miko main engine cut off. Yep. But it was really interesting because we scrubbed on the first attempt. Ah. Two nights later, we, we went to fly and I was like, this is not going to happen. This is going to be dress rehearsal number two. Yep. So I was just chilling. I took a little bit of a nap, and then we got to the T minus nine minute hole, which is the the last hole where yep. the flight director pulls everybody. And you know everyone was go go go, and we got to weather. And I'm holding my breath, so I'm thinking if weather says no go this time, I'm going to be upset. <laughs> weather says go. And yep. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's we may actually, actually launch. Actually, going to happen. And we got down to six seconds. The engines lit, and I was like, we're going to space. <laughs> um, and so. We got to space, it was the most significant thing was about six and a half minutes where you feel the most G-forces, Right. about three and a half G's chest in, so breathing out was a little labor because it felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest, ah. about 30 seconds or so, but after that happened, you know, you could actually fool yourself, you kind of came up a little bit in your seat because yeah. now you're you're out of the, the gravitational the pull of the earth, yeah. right? Um, and then Miko. So at Miko, Krister, who was sitting next to me, had to like rip off his helmet, get out of his suit, get the camera out the locker, float upstairs and see the actual tank. Point. And it was it was a hard timeline. Yeah. So we had planned this on the ground. He takes off his helmet. He, I put it in the bag. He goes to the locker and, it, and we got it. Because that's just something you can't nice. repeat. So you yep. don't want to mess it it's up. It's one shot to get exactly. it done. Exactly. No, can you practice that? Like on the ground, did you have that process practice, but you weren't in microgravity, right? We did, exactly. And it's a little different when you're floating, especially your first time out, and you're like, whoa, it's kind of like a, a new duckling. You're just a little awkward, <laughs> Sort of waddling right? and exactly. trying to get your, get your so, set yeah, your, your We space practiced legs. it at nauseam on the ground, and we changed a couple of things to make sure that we had it choreographed, and, and we hit it. Nice. It, it was a little frantic, but we hit it. Like, like, think about that, y'all. Um, sometimes when you practice things, they use the, the NBL, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, right, right. and they have the big spacesuits on, and they're practicing their EVA, and right. that's how they simulate the, the microgravity, right. right? Well, if you're supposed to be in the cockpit, in the mid-deck, and you're passing a camera up and that, you can't simulate that can't. in the NBL. You can't be in the big, bulky spacesuit. Right. So how do you practice that specifically? It was just the process, it right? It was the process. So we were on one of the static trainers, right. and we, I mean, we went very slow. I'm going to hand you my helmet. I will put it in the bag. I'll get out of my seat. I'll go to the locker. And we just practiced it that way. We actually came up with a couple of from suggestions from other crews, some yeah. things we may want to do differently, but you, you just have to practice it in a static environment and pray that your practice paid off when <laughs> you're in space. <laughs> did you, I, I mean, you don't have to tell me if you don't, but you, did, did you have any hiccups? Like, I've practiced this a hundred times, and then when they hand you the helmet, you're like, no, not that bag, this bag. <laughs> no, I would we, get psyched out. We, we, well, you know, you can psych yourself out yeah. about a couple of things, but we, we did it. We did it just as we practiced just like it, you practiced. and it worked, and he got great images of the tank floating away. Gotcha. Excellent. I mean, we need to try and find, if we could find an image that was taken like that, because that's the big orange tank, right. the, the ET floating away after right. it decoupled from the, the orbiter itself, the space shuttle. Exactly. Nice. Um, so while we were walking around the floor, we actually met up with the folks from NASA Marshall who were sewing us some space food. Yeah. And for us, it didn't look very tasty. <laughs> it was like, that's a sausage patty? <laughs> Did you have any favorite meals while you were on shuttle? Did you say like, I really like the mac and cheese or whatever? So the, the good thing is that we had a taste testing class. Yes. And we got to test everything. And either you could do your own menu or you could let the dietitians do your menu. I chose to do my own. Right. One of my favorite was uh, beef enchiladas. Beef enchiladas. Which was, uh, they were a little spicier on orbit than I remember them being on okay. the ground. And maybe it was just my memory, <laughs> but I just thought they were a tad bit spicier. But I'll share a story with you. 
Rachel Ray was about to begin her show that year. Oh, it was like Rachel came... Ray the astronaut? No. Wait, different Rachel Ray. <laughs> Rachel Ray the, the cook. The cook. She uh, she came down and our crew was, was there and we showed her around the, the cockpit of one of the, the static shuttle images. Yeah. And she actually made some food for us to take on orbit. And she was a little bit taken aback that it had to be dehydrated. Because <laughs> I guess she wanted it to have some presentation. They like, just, right. put it in some Tupperware and they sent it up <laughs> right, with you. Like, right. Come on, it's not a corned beef so, sandwich here. Like. Exactly. <laughs> and so she did some things. Now, I never got to taste it because the guys took it out. I floated to get my, my utensil so I could eat. I came back and, like, the food was gone. No. So I never got to taste Rachel Ray's food for us. Really? Really. <laughs> That's so disappointing. Those guys, I it's, tell you It's what. like you have to put, a, we've heard stories from my and some other astronauts where they like label their favorite foods like this is the last pack of enchiladas don't eat it it's for Joan like did you do anything did no, you put but, one aside or anything no but you know all the food is color coded everyone has a color on the mission ah. my color was brown so okay. if I saw somebody eating some food with the brown dot on it I knew it was mine but no we were pretty good if we didn't want something, we had a locker where we would stow some other things. That was a free-for-all locker. Yep, yep. Otherwise, you better eat your color food. <laughs> like the community locker. Right, exactly. You can like grab a snack or something. Exactly. But over here, this right. has my sticker Hands on off. it. Hands off. Hands <laughs> off. Yep. Um, no kidding. So uh, back to the ride up to space, right? Like when you were taking off, how does the actual ride to space on a space shuttle contrast with what you see in movies? Like movies are all, oh, the camera's like this, and oh, we have to hold on. It, is it's, it more it's chill? It's not. It's a little more chill. So what I compare it to is if you've ever been on an old wooden rickety roller coaster. Ah. And as you're going up that first hill, there's a little bit of this <laughs> going on. <laughs> that, that's yep. kind of how it is until the boosters separate. Once the boosters go, the, route, the, the ride is really smooth. Yeah. No kidding. Those boosters are, are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I have no clue where we are in the time right now. It's four o'clock right now. Good. So we still have some time. We, you are getting on a plane, and we want to make I sure we get to the airport. I'm getting on a plane. Yes, and I, I can't miss my plane home. <laughs> There'll be a car waiting for you, ready to go. Do you go through the airport in the NASA yeah, regalia? Yeah, no, I'm changing clothes. You change out to like be a little more low profile. Yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. So we have a little bit of time for some more questions here. Sorry, Alicia is waving at me from behind the scenes. I, I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, okay, one more question and then we'll go. I can't hear what Oh, no. Uh, oh, no. She's going to pull you into this debate. <laughs> so a, a big thing online is everybody loves their favorite orbiters and they have their favorite logos and that sort of thing. So Alicia is asking. Uh, <laughs> notice how I put that on Alicia in the Internet. And she's putting it on the Internet. <laughs> exactly. The Internet wants to know. The Internet wants to know. Um, which NASA logo do you love the most? We love them all. Uh, you know, we, 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 we do love them all, and that's kind of going to be my answer. Yeah. So I think there's a place for either. So when I came in, it was the NASA meatball. Yeah. It's classic and clean. And then you have the worm, which is kind of modern and funky. You know? yeah, so yeah. I think there's a place for both. Okay. Uh, I don't I don't know that I have a favorite. I, oh. I like it's NASA. How can you not like it? Dodge. <laughs> she likes both of them. Well, I, I like to say the worm fits on rockets and boosters really well. Because it's sort of a long, and long they were just putting lean, them right. on the uh, Artemis boosters. Okay. NASA released a bunch of images of them putting that big worm logo on the Artemis booster. Oh, okay. And it works really well with the boosters. We like all there the NASA go. logos. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, like It started with a big theme with Kids Week here is you don't have to be a rocket scientist to get involved with NASA. Oh, yeah. You've worked with a lot of different talented people who might not be people who are math whizzes or engineers or rocket scientist. Can you tell us about some of the other people and the other skill sets yeah. that a lot of folks out there might have that can help us get into space and live and work in space? Well, you have to realize that NASA is a business as well. Yeah. And so you need people in human resources, you need people in financing, people in accounting. Yep. You need a lot of business acumen there. So there are people who are just totally not STEM STEAM people that help run the show. Right. And then you do have those scientists who say, we're going to visit this asteroid. So you have people doing that. So it's a little bit of everybody. There are business people, there are STEM people, but there is a role for yep. everybody, believe it or not, at yep. NASA. But yesterday, if y'all remember yesterday, if you walked our walk around interviews, uh, we met the guy whose cat was the cat that was beamed back from space. 
the laser communications and it was a cat video and he was helping with NASA. He filmed his cat and now he works, does graphics and stuff for NASA. Okay. And so there's so many different roles, there's so many different ways that there folks are. can get involved. Do you have any advice? People always ask, um, what can I do to get a foot in the door? Who should I talk to? What's important for, for folks that want to get in? So I would say you can actually start in high school because a lot of the NASA centers have programs for high school students. Yep. So apply. Um, if you don't get in your freshman year, keep applying. That, that's my thing. You keep trying. Yep. And once you get your foot in the door, you're golden. There are many different places that you can go. If you're trying to get into NASA after college, right. again, apply. But I would recommend that you try to do internships okay. because that allows you to do a couple of things. First of all, it allows you to get your name known throughout the NASA centers. Yep. And it also gives you the ability to look at different jobs because maybe you thought you wanted to do job X and you've got to intern in job X. You're like, this is not what it's I like, wanted eh, to do. Actually, right? Yeah. That's a less that's a valuable lesson as well as, oh, I want to do job Y, this is the job for me. So getting your foot in the door in an internship is a great way to do it. All this information is on the NASA website. So right. you can Google the different centers, you can Google the programs that they have and figure out where you're, you best fits. Yeah. So that's, it's something that we hear a lot, like sort of getting plugged in yes. and oh. not only getting the skills, but also making some of the contacts. Exactly. And if you get involved in those NASA programs or with companies that are working with NASA programs right. all the way back to high school, right. um, that is a way that you can not only build the skills, but also sort of get, get your name in the little books right. and start talking, like it's, get your name out there. It's all about relationships and uh, knowing people is a very good thing. Excellent. But the, the really important thing is don't think that just because you're not a rocket scientist, oh, I can't help NASA. There's so many different skill sets that can help NASA out. Absolutely. And actually now, as we're looking to go to the moon and the Mars, I say we because I, I, I will it's never okay. not hey, be part of I'll the NASA family. I'll say we. I'm like, we're going to the moon and Mars. Like, <laughs> I'm there. They're looking at uh, designers. So they can help design modules and different habitats. Yep. And it's not the old, very structured things anymore. They're looking for different ideas. So we have designers that they were working with. Yep. So, you know, traditional careers or non-traditional careers are also very valuable for these things that we're going to do out in the future. Yeah. I mean, you got to think about it. Like, uh, at some point, we're going to need a moon chair. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody's going to need to design a moon chair. I, right. I don't know how to design a moon chair. I don't know right. if anybody does. But uh, we'll move from a, you know, this is the NASA chair, and it is very functional, and you are strapped in, and, and we need a cool moon chair. Right. This maybe, maybe something not. a little sleek and yeah. more ergonomic. Who exactly. Knows? Ergonomic for a one-sixth gravity there instead you of go. normal gravity. Absolutely. All right. Um, we want to get you in. Oh, there's some more questions there, actually. Do you like Star Trek or Star Wars? This is coming straight from the internet now. Yes. Yes. And so I would say that I I was a Trekkie fan late. I yep. didn't watch it when they were first on. I got into Star Trek during the syndication. Yeah. And I've always been a Star Wars. As a matter of fact, I took a picture with Chewie, with Darth Vader, and C-3PO. Nice. <laughs> the 501st is first is down here running around with all of their their not costumes, their actual personalities running there around down there. Yes. Let's see here. Um ah. So are you interested in ever going to space again on Absolutely. A, yes, you heartbeat. just yes. and a heartbeat. Do you have any rockets or capsules or systems that you're looking at? Like, oh, I'd really love to fly on the Dragon. Or... I'd love to fly on something that would get me there safely and back. There you go. So anything that <laughs> you can get us safely? Not particular. Huh? Nice. Not particular. Not particular. All right. Let's see here. Um, that covered a couple of questions of private mission, because all these private companies are now building space capsules yeah. and sort of stuff now. Uh, but just a, a caveat to that. Yeah. I, I don't know how to say this. I want to go for like two weeks. I don't want to go for 10 minutes. That's just not, yeah. You don't want to jump I'd out of kiss, the atmosphere kiss, kiss like Earth. a space no, porpoise. I don't, I don't need to do that. No. Gotcha. You've already been in orbit for days, so you want to go to stay a little longer. Absolutely. Do you think it'd be different? Um, would you go to space and feel like you needed a, a task list to follow? Or would you want to go to space and be like, you know, I'm just going to chill out this time. I'm just going to enjoy it. You, you know, I am a true engineer at heart, and like when I travel, I use an Excel, Excel spreadsheet to pack. <laughs> My husband makes fun of me, so I think I need a checklist. You need a checklist. I'm just, I'm just wired that way, so yeah. You're not just going to go up there and like sip space drinks with little no, space umbrellas no. on it. You, you want to do something. But give me some time to look out the cupola, because that's got to be 
wicked and wild. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, we want to get. I'm, I'm handing the phone back to Alicia. Um, we want to get you on your way to the airport here. Is there anything else that you want to tell people? Like you're always, oh, I wish that they had asked me this or. No, I just say uh, it's great. I I came here today. This is my first kids week for the Intrepid Museum. Excellent. It's phenomenal. There were so many kids running through. I got some really great questions. And I wish I had something like this when I was younger yep. that to put me on the track a little sooner. Yep. You know, I got there and that's all that matters. But if we can start getting these kids interested earlier, all the better. Excellent. It really is where it started. Like, it you come to the museum and you remember you're going to be right. older one day. And, oh, I remember I went to the Intrepid and there was an astronaut on stage. Right. And she answered my question. Like, one little spark like that. And even is the ones they bring kicking and screaming one day, they're going to remember <laughs> this and maybe be appreciative. Kicking and screaming. Nice. <laughs> um, anyways, Joan, thank you so much for the time. Thank Let's you. get Appreciate you on the road. It. Absolutely. Um, Folks, thank you all for watching as well. Uh, we are going to go ahead and end our live coverage here from Intrepid Museum Kids Week. Again, thank you all so much for all the support, supporting what Intrepid does and our ability to share this with you all. But for now, that's going to be the end of our show, and we will see you nerds later. <laughs> Thanks, Joan. Thanks, Joan. <laughs> Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Always a and here we go. Chamber pressure looks good. Following up. Water tower is fine! Yes! He goes down to the nominal. Fighting down to the off. Bring it, let's see the off. It's fine! Oh my god! Oh my god! Nicolas! Put that in the big bag. 343 unfolds to go. Indeed. We rise together, back to the moon and beyond. Yeah! Yeah! If there's nothing to be igniting the flare, correct? Right?